Two of these men are Turkish, the other is Greek. But in the 1920s, their parents were forced to leave their homes. Some feared for their lives, others were given no choice but to leave. All were part of what became the 1923 population exchange. Orthodox Christians who had never lived in Greece were forced to leave Turkey, and Muslims who had never lived in Turkey were forced to leave Greece. They did not know what to do. They had nothing because they left everything behind. What was waiting for them? Just darkness. Thousands of people tried to crowd onto ships ill-equipped to carry them, camped in dire conditions and facing threats from deadly diseases. That exchange brought unhappiness to lots of people because it was something painful and hard. But on the other hand, I have to admit that the two populations were separated. The huge exodus was meant to be the solution to a decades-old problem. Under the Ottoman Empire, Christians and Muslims had managed to live side by side. But as it collapsed, tensions increased. Muslim minorities in its former European territories were persecuted, as were Christians in what became modern-day Turkey. After the First World War, Turkey won a war of independence, and that included a three-year campaign against a Greek army that landed on the Turkish mainland. And it was at that point that the international community decided, in order to prevent any more bloodshed, that there should be a huge population exchange. And this is the story of two of the families that were involved. Yanis Glavakis runs a business growing trees in northern Greece. He's also a former member of the European Parliament. But tracing his own roots has also been important to him. Both his parents left Turkey at the time of the exchange. His father Yorgos fled when he was 18, while fighting between Turks and Greeks was continuing. He lost three siblings in the violence and told this story of his attempt to leave. The port was very crowded and there were Turkish soldiers keeping order. My father was worried his family wouldn't reach a ship. He pushed the soldier and indeed his mother, grandmother and three siblings could move ahead, but the soldiers did not forget this. He had fallen down, but after he had got up, he got to my father. He lifted his gun to hit him and my father felt something, and after he turned around, the gun hit him right here. He had the scar until he died. The guy hit so hard that he fell into the sea. He managed to grab the ropes, holding the ship. This was how he survived, because he couldn't swim. Suleiman Mazloum is an architect and university professor in Istanbul. His mother left the village where Yanis now lives, when she was five. She told him few details about her journey, but records show her family had been quite wealthy in Greece, leaving behind two houses, two mills and orchards to come to Turkey, where they couldn't speak the language. When they had something to deal with at an official building, they didn't have anyone to help them and they were shy. They would sit in front of the building until someone came out and asked if they need any help. If no one asked, they would come back the next day. On the outskirts of Istanbul is a museum run by the Foundation of Lausanne Treaty Immigrants. It houses an exhibition of items testifying to the lives of those affected and the horrific journeys they endured. Handmade clothes, migration and property documents, and this prayer mat. Not just one or two villages, five or six, sometimes ten villages would arrive at the same time. There would be a huge crowd at the port. Diseases would spread and because of that and the lack of care and food, people would die on those ships. To prevent an epidemic, they would throw the bodies into the sea. While Suleyman Kara's family was immigrating to Turkey, their baby died on the ship. They kept his body inside this prayer rug so it wouldn't be thrown into the sea. And they kept him until they reached their destination and buried him there. 
Suleiman is packing to take a trip back in time to retrace the steps taken by his mother to start a new life in Turkey. He's come with his brother to the Greek port of Thessaloniki, where similar scenes of desperation were witnessed, including by his parents. They stayed in tents that were built in this area. Thousands of people arrived and the ships were not enough for them. The Red Crescent built tents here. It means a lot to be here and to understand what they felt when they left, not being able to come back. Meanwhile, Yanis has traveled to the west coast town of Almutlu, the place where his father used to live in Turkey. Only a bridge which separated the Turkish and Greek neighborhoods remains from before the population exchange. Yanis has come to meet the town's mayor, who he's known for several years. <laughs> he brought gifts of olive and laurel trees as a sign of peace and friendship and is checking on their development. In ancient Greece, champions were honored with olive branches. Suleiman is also traveling, but he is going to Piperia, the village where his mother used to live. Little remains here too of the original Turkish village. There's now a church. His mother's house is no longer standing and he's not sure of its exact location. Instead, he has to use his imagination. They probably sat here, had a drink and chatted. But there's one last stop for Suleiman to make, a visit to see his old friend Yanis. They met several years ago on a trip organized by the Lausanne Foundation. They were able to bond over their family's shared experiences and a view that what happened almost a hundred years ago should not be forgotten, even though most of those who experienced it are no longer around to tell their stories. I believe that the suffering our families went through will not be repeated if the two nations come closer to each other, understand each other and build friendships. We have to make a special effort to make sure both nations understand this suffering and stop it happening again. When I go to Turkey, I feel like I'm home. When I sit in Taksim Square, I see the faces I see in Greece. When I go to have dinner, I eat the food my mom used to make. When I sit somewhere and hear the music my dad used to dance to, I feel like dancing myself. I want to send a message of friendship to the Turkish nation. My friends, I'm inviting you here. I'm happy when you come here. Stay happy. Yanis' love for Turkey is evident in his collection of memorabilia, including antique postcards from Istanbul, when it was known as Constantinople, and when a huge population exchange involving one and a half million people was thought of as the best way to deal with a potential international crisis. Andrew Hopkins, Straight Talk. Yeah, yeni cami, yeni cami. Yeni cami. E,